This is CS50 week five. So today in this week, we introduce a little bit of the world of forensics in the context of problem set four. Today will be an abbreviated lecture because there's a special event in here afterwards. So we'll take a peek and tease both students and parents alike today with some of the things that are on the horizon. Among them, as of Monday, you will have a few more classmates. edX, Harvard and MIT's new online initiative for open courseware, and more is launching on Harvard's campus on Monday, which means come Monday you will have, as of last count, 86,000 additional classmates who will be following along with CS50's lectures and sections and walkthroughs and problem sets. And as part of this, you will become members of the inaugural class of CS50 and now CS50X. As part of this, now realize that there will be some upsides as well to, to get ready for this、uh, for the、uh, massive number of students. Suffice it to say that even though we have 108 TFs and CAs, It's not quite the best student teacher ratio once we hit 80,000 of the students. So, we're not going to be grading so many problem sets manually. So, introduced this week in the problem set will be CS50 Check, which is going to be a command line utility within the appliance that you'll get once you update it、uh, later this weekend. And you'll be able to run a command, Check 50, on your own P set, and you'll get instant feedback as to whether your program is correct or incorrect according to various design specifications that we have provided. So, more on that in the problem set specification. And the CS50X classmates will be using this as well. So, problem set four is all about forensics. And this piece that was really inspired by some real life stuff, whereby when I was in graduate school, I interned for a while with the Middlesex County District,、uh, District Attorney's Office doing forensic work with their lead forensic investigator. And what this amounted to, as I think I mentioned a few weeks past, is the Mass State Police or others would come in, they would drop off things like hard drives and CDs and floppy disks and the like. And then the goal of the forensics office was to ascertain whether there was or was not evidence of some sort. This was the Special Investigations Unit, so it was white. Collar crime, it was more, uh, 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 more、uh, troubling sort of crimes, anything involving some kind of digital media. Turns out that not that many people、uh, write an email、uh, saying, I did it. So, quite often, these forensic searches did not turn up all that much、uh, fruit, but sometimes people would write such emails. So,、uh, sometimes the efforts were rewarded. But to lead up to this forensic P set, we'll be introducing in P set for a bit of Uh, graphics. So, you probably take these things for granted JPEGs, GIFs, and the like these days. But if you really think about it, an image, much like Rob's face, can be modeled as a sequence of dots or pixels. Now, in the case of Rob's face, there's all sorts of colors, and we started to see the individual dots, otherwise known as pixels, once we started to zoom in. But if we simplify the world a bit and just say that this here is Rob in、um, black and white, well, to represent black and white, we can just use binary. And if we're going to use binary, one or zero, We can express this same image of a smile, Rob's smiling face、um, with this pattern of bits. 100011 represents white, white, black, 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 white, white. And so it's not a huge leap then to start talking about. Colorful photographs, things that you'd see on Facebook or take with a digital camera, but certainly when it comes to colors, you need more bits. And quite common in the world of photographs is to use not one bit color, as this suggests, but 24 bit color, where you actually get millions of colors. So, as in the case when we zoomed in on Rob's eye, that was any number of millions of different colorful possibilities. So, we'll introduce this in problem set four, as well as in the walkthrough, which will be today at 3 30 instead of the usual 2 30 because of Friday's lecture here,、um, but it will video. Will Will be online as usual tomorrow. But we'll also introduce you to another file format. So, this is deliberately meant to look intimidating at first, but this is just some documentation for. A C struct. So it turns out that Microsoft years ago helped popularize this format called the bitmap file format, BMP. And this was a super simple, colorful graphical file format that was used for quite some time and sometimes still for wallpapers on desktops. If you think back to like Windows XP and the rolling hills and the blue sky, that was typically a BMP or bitmap image. And bitmaps are fun for us because they have a bit more complexity. It's not quite as simple as this grid of zeros and ones. Instead, you have Have things like a header at the start of a file. So, in other words, inside of a .bmp file, there's a whole bunch of zeros and ones, but there's some additional zeros and ones in there. And it turns out that what we've probably taken for granted for years, file formats like .doc or .xls or .mp3, .mp4, whatever the file formats that you're familiar with, well, what does it even mean to be a file format? Because at the end of the day, all of these files we use have just zeros and ones. And maybe those zeros and ones represent ABC. Through ASCII or the like, but at the end of the day, it's still just zeros and ones. So humans just occasionally decide to invent a new file format where they standardize what patterns of bits 
will actually mean. And in this case here, the folks who designed the bitmap file format said that at the very first byte in a bitmap file, as denoted by offset 0 there, there's going to be some cryptically named variable called bf type, which just stands for bitmap file type. What type of bitmap file is this? You can infer perhaps from the second row that、uh, offset 2, byte number 2, has a pattern of zeros and ones that represents what? So, the size of something, and it goes on from there. So, in problem set four, you'll be walked through some of these things. We, don't, we won't end up caring about all of them, but notice it starts to get interesting around line or byte 54,、uh, RGBT blue, green and red. If you've ever heard the acronym RGB, red, green, blue, this is a reference to that because it turns out you can paint all the colors of the rainbow with some combination of red and blue and green. And in fact,、um, the parents in the room might, re- re- might recall some of the earliest. Projectors. These days, you just see one bright light coming out of a lens. But back in the day, you had the red lens, the blue lens, and the green lens. And together, they aimed at a screen and formed a colorful picture. And quite often, middle schools and high schools would have those lenses ever so slightly askew. So you were sort of seeing double or triple images. But that was the idea. You had red and green and blue light painting a picture. And that same principle is used in computers. So among the challenges then for you in problem set four are going to be a few things. One is to actually resize in Image, to take in a pattern of zeros and ones, figure out which chunks of zeros and ones represent what in a structure like this, and then figure out how to replicate the pixels, the reds, the blues, the greens inside, so that what a picture looks like this initially might look like this instead after that. Among the other challenges, too, is going to be that you'll be handed a forensic image of an actual file from a digital camera. And on that camera, once upon a time, were a whole bunch of photos. The problem is we accidentally Erased or had the image corrupted somehow. Bad things happen with digital cameras. And so we quickly copied all of the zeros and ones off of that card for you, save them all in one big file, and then we'll hand them to you in problem set four so that you can write a program in C with which to recover all of those JPEGs,、uh, ideally. And it turns out that JPEGs, even though they're somewhat of a complex file format, they're much more complex than this smiling face here. It turns out that every JPEG starts. With the same patterns of zeros and ones. So, using ultimately a while loop or a、uh, for loop or similar, you can iterate over all the zeros and ones in this forensic image. And every time you see the special pattern that's defined in the problem set specification, you can assume, oh, here is with very high probability the start of a JPEG. And as soon as you find the same pattern, some number of bytes or kilobytes or megabytes later, you can assume, ooh, here is a second JPEG, the photo I took after the first one. Let me stop reading. Reading that first file, start writing this new one, and the output of your program for PSET 4 is going to be as many as 50. JPEGs. And if it's not 50 JPEGs, you have a bit of a loop.、Uh, if you have an infinite number of JPEGs, you have an infinite loop. So that too will be quite a common case. So that's what's on the horizon. Quiz zero behind us、um, realized per my email that invariably there's folks who are both happy, sort of neutral, and sad around quiz zero time. And please do reach out to me, the head CF, Zamila, your own CF, or one of the CAs that you know if you would like to discuss how things went. So to impress the parents here in the room, what is the CS50 library? Good job. What's the CS50 library? Yeah. OK, a y good. So it's a, pre, a pre written set of code that we, the staff, wrote, we provide to you that provides some common functionality, stuff like get me a string, get me an int, all of the functions that are listed here. Well, starting now, we start to really take these training wheels off. So we're going to start to take away a string from you, which recall was just a synonym for what actual data type? Char star. So,、uh, for parents, that was probably, well, so that's good. So, char star will start to see on the screen all the more as we remove string from our vocabulary, at least when it comes to actually writing code. Similarly, we'll stop using some of these functions as much because our programs are going to get more sophisticated. Rather than just write programs that sit there with a prompt blinking, waiting for the user to type something in, you'll get your inputs from elsewhere. For instance, you'll get them from a series of bits on the local hard drive. You'll instead get them in the future from a network connection. Some Website somewhere. So let's peel back this layer for the first time and pull up the CS50 appliance and this file called CS50.h, which you've been sharp including for weeks. But let's actually see what's inside of this. So the top of the file in blue is just a whole bunch of co-、uh, comments,、um, warranty information, and licensing. This is sort of a common paradigm in software because a lot of software these days is what's called open source, which means that someone has written the code. 
and made it freely available, not just to run and to use, but to actually read and alter and integrate into your own work. So that's what you've been using open source software, albeit in a very small form. If I scroll down past the comments, though, we'll start to see some more familiar things. So notice at the top here, That the CS50.h file includes a whole bunch of header files. Now, most of these we haven't seen before, but one is familiar. Which of these have we seen, albeit briefly, thus far? Yeah, so standard library, standard lib.h has malloc. So once we started talking about dynamic memory allocation, which we'll come back to next week as well, we started including that file. It turns out that bool and true and false don't actually exist in C per se unless you include this file here. So we have, for weeks, been including standard bool.h so that you can use the notion of a bool, true or false. Without this, you would have to sort of fake it and use an int and just arbitrarily assume that zero is false and one is true. Now, if we scroll down further, here is our definition of a string. It turns out, as, as we've said before, that where this star is doesn't really matter. You can even have space all around.、Um, we had, this semester have been promoting it as this to make clear that the star has to do with the type, but realize just as common, if not a little more common, is to put it there, but functionally it's the same thing. But now, if we read down further, let's take a look at, say, get int, because we use that perhaps first before anything else this semester. And here is get int. This is what? This is just a prototype. So often we have put prototypes at the tops of our .c files, but you can also put prototypes in header files, .h files, like this one here, so that when you write some functions that you want other people to be able to use, which is exactly the case with the CS50 library, you not only implement your functions in something like CS50.c, you also put the prototypes not at the top of that file, but at the top of a header file. Then that header file is what. Friends and colleagues include with sharp include in their own code. So, all this time you've been including all of these prototypes effectively at the top of your file, but by way of this sharp include mechanism, which essentially copies and pastes this file into your own. Now, here is some fairly、uh, detailed documentation. We've pretty much taken for granted that get int gets an int, but it turns out there's some corner cases, right? What if the user types in a number that's way too big,、uh, a quintillion that just can't fit inside of an int? What is the expected behavior? Well, ideally, it's predictable. So, in this case, if you actually read the fine print, you'll actually see that if the line can't be read, this returns int max. We've never talked about this, but based on its capitalization, what is it probably? It's a constant. So, it's some special constant that's probably declared in one of those header files that's up higher in the file. And int max is probably something like roughly 2 billion. The idea being that because we need to somehow signify that something went wrong, we, yes, have 4 billion numbers at our disposal, negative 2 billion on up to 2 billion, give or take. Well, what is common in programming is you steal just one of those numbers, maybe zero. Maybe、uh, 2 billion, maybe negative 2 billion. So you, you spend one of your possible values so that you can commit to the world that if something goes wrong, I will return this super big value. But you don't want the user typing something cryptic like 2, 3, 4, dot, 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 a really big number, where you generalize it instead as a constant. So really, if you were being anal the past few weeks, anytime you call get int, you should have been checking with an if condition. Did the user type in int max? Or more specifically, did get int return int max? Because if it did, that actually means they didn't type it. Something went wrong in this case. So this is what's generally known as a sentinel value, which just means special. Well, let's now turn into the .c file. So the C file has existed on, in the appliance for some time. And in fact, the appliance has it. Pre compiled for you into that thing we called object code, but it just doesn't matter to you where it is because the system knows, in this case, where it is, the appliance. But let's scroll down now to get int and see how get int has been working all this time. So here we have similar comments from before. Let me zoom in on just the code portion. And what we have for get int is the following so it takes no input, it returns an int. While true, so we have a deliberate infinite loop, but presumably we'll break out of this somehow or return from within this. So let's see how this works. Well, we seem to be using get string in this first line inside the loop, 166. This is now good practice because under what circumstances could get string return this special keyword null? If something goes wrong. And what could go wrong when you call something like get string?
Yeah, so maybe malloc fails, right? Somewhere underneath the hood, getString is calling malloc, which allocates memory, which、uh, lets the computer store all of the characters that the user types in the keyboard. And suppose the user had a whole lot of free time and typed more, for instance, than 2 billion characters in, more characters than the computer even has RAM. Well, getString has to be able to signify that to you, even if this is a super, super uncommon corner case. It has to somehow be able to handle this. And so, getString, if we went back and read its documentation, does in fact return null. So now, if getString fails by returning Returning null, get int is going to fail by returning int max, just as a sentinel. These are just human conventions. The only way you would know this is the case is by reading the documentation. So let's scroll down to where the int is actually gotten. So if I scroll down a bit further, in line 170, We have a comment above these lines. So we declare in 172 an int n and a char c, and then this new function, which some of you have stumbled across before, but sscanf. So this stands for string scanf. In other words, give me a string and I will scan it for pieces of information of interest. So, what does that mean? Well, suppose that I type in literally 1, 2, 3 at the keyboard and then hit enter. What is the data type of 1, 2, 3 when returned by getString? So, it's obviously a string, right? I got a string. So, 1, 2, 3 is really quote unquote 1, 2, 3 with the backslash 0 at the end of it. That is not an int. That's not a number. It looks like a number, but it's not actually. So, what does get int have to do? It has to scan that string left to right, 1, 2, 3, backslash 0, and somehow convert it to an actual integer. Now, you could figure out how to do this, right? If you think back to pset 2, you, you presumably got a little comfortable with Caesar or Visionaire. So, you can iterate over a string, you can convert chars to ints, but heck, that's a whole lot of work. Why not call a function like sscanf that does that for you? So, fscanf expects an argument, in this case called line, which is a string. You then specify in quotes, very similar to printf, what do you expect to see in this string? And what I'm saying here is I expect to see a, string,、uh, a decimal number and maybe a character. And we'll see why this is the case in just a moment. And it turns out that this notation is now reminiscent of stuff we started talking about just over a week ago. What is ampersand n and ampersand c doing for us here? Yeah, it's giving me the address of n and address of c. Now, why is that important? Well, you know that with functions in c, you can always return a value or no value at all. You can return an int, a string, a float, a char, whatever, or you can return void. But you can only return one. Thing maximally. But here, we want sscanf to return me maybe an int, a decimal number, and also a char. And I'll explain why the char in a moment. So you effectively want sscanf to return two things, but that's just not possible in C. So you can work around that by passing in two addresses. Because as soon as you hand a function two addresses, what can that function do with them? It can write to those addresses, right? You can use the star operation and go there to each of those addresses. So it's sort of this backdoor mechanism, but very common for changing the values of variables more, in, more than just one place, in this case, two. Now, notice I'm checking e- for equal equal to one and then returning n if that does, in fact, evaluate to true. So what's going on? Well, technically, all we really want to happen in get int is this we want to parse, so to speak, we want to read the string. Quote unquote, one, two, three. And if it looks like there's a number there, what we're telling sscanf to do is put that number, one, two, three, in this variable n for me. So why then did I actually have this as well? What is the role of also saying sscanf,、eh, you might also get a character here? Not,、uh, decimal point actually could work. Let's, let's hold that thought for a moment. What else? So, good thought. It could be the null character. It's actually not in this case. Yeah? ASCII. So, or let me generalize even further. The percent %c there is just for error checking. We don't want there to be a character after the number. But what this allows me to do is the following it turns out that sscanf, besides storing values in n and c in this example here, what it also does is it returns the number of variables it put values in. So, if you only type in 1, 2, 3, then only the percent %d is going to match, and only n gets stored with a value like 1, 2, 3, and nothing gets put in c. c remains a garbage value, so to speak. Garbage because it's never been initialized to some value. So, in that case, sscanf returns 1 because I populated one of those pointers, in which case, great, I have an int, so I free the line to free up the memory that gets string actually allocated, and then I return n. Else, if you ever wondered where that retry statement comes from, 
comes from right here. So if by contrast I type in one, two, three, foo, just some random sequence of text, scanf is going to see, ooh, number, ooh, number, ooh, number, ooh, f. And it's going to put the one, two, three in n. It's going to put the f in c and then return. Two. So we have just using the basic definition of scanf's behavior, very simple way, well, complex at first glance, but at the end of the day, fairly simple mechanism of saying, is there an int? And if so, is that the only thing that I found? And the white space here is delivered. If you read the documentation for scanf, it tells you that if you include a piece of white space at the beginning or the end, scanf2 will allow the user, for whatever reason, to hit spacebar, one, two, three, and that will be legitimate. You won't yell at the user just because they hit the spacebar at the beginning or the end, which is just a little more. User friendly. Any questions then on get int? Yeah. Good question. What if you just typed in a char like f and hit enter without ever typing one, two, three? What do you think the behavior of this line of code would then be? So, yeah, so scanf can cover that too, because in that case, it's not going to fill n or c, it's going to instead return zero. In which case, I'm also catching that scenario because the expected value I want is one. I only want one and only one thing to be filled. Good question. Others? All right, so let's not go through all of the functions in here, but the one that seems to be perhaps of remaining interest is getString. Because it turns out that get float, get int, get double, get long, long all punt a lot of their functionality to getString. So let's take a look at how he is implemented here. So this one. Looks a little complex, but it uses the same fundamentals that we started talking about last week. So in getString, which takes no argument, as per the void up here, and it returns a string. So I apparently am declaring a string called buffer. I don't really know what that's going to be used for yet, but we'll see. Looks like capacity is by default zero. Not quite sure where this is going. Not sure what n is going to be used for yet. But now it's getting a little more interesting. So in line 243, We declare an int c. This is sort of a stupid detail. A char is 8 bits. And an char- 8 bits can store how many different values? 256. The problem is, if you want to have 256 different ASCII characters, which there are, if you think back, and this is not something to memorize, but if you think back to that big ASCII chart we had weeks ago, there were, in that case, 128 or 256 ASCII characters. We used all the patterns of zeros and ones up. That's a problem if you want to be able to detect an error. Because if you're already using 256 values for your characters, you didn't really plan ahead. Because now you have no way of saying, this is not a legit character, this is some erroneous message. So what the world does is they use the next biggest value, something like an int, so that you have a crazy number of bits, 32 for 4 billion possible values, so that you can simply end up using essentially 250. Seven of them, one of which has some special meaning as an error. So let's see how this works. In line 246, I have this big while loop that is calling f get c, f meaning file, so get c, and then standard in. Turns out this is just the more precise way of saying read input from the keyboard. Standard input means keyboard, standard output means screen, and standard error, which we'll see in pset4, means the screen, but a special part of the screen so that it's not conflated with actual output that you. Intended to print, but more on that in the future. So f get c just means read one character from the keyboard and store it where? Store it in c. And then check, so I'm just using some Boolean、uh, conjunctions here, check that it doesn't equal backslash n, right? So the user has hit enter. We want to stop at that point, end, end of the loop. And we also want to check for this special constant, eof, which if you know or guess, what does it stand for? End of file. So this is kind of nonsensical because if I'm typing at the keyboard, there's really no file involved in this. But this is just sort of the generic term used to mean that nothing else is coming from the human's fingers. EOF, end of file. So this is, as an aside, if you've ever hit Control D at your keyboard, not that you would have yet, you've hit Control C, but Control D sends this special constant called EOF. So now we just have some. Dynamic memory allocation. So if n plus 1 is greater than capacity, so now I'll explain n. n is just how many bytes are currently in the buffer, the string that you're currently building up from the user. If you have more characters in your buffer than you have capacity in the buffer, intuitively what we need to do then is allocate more capacity. So I'm going to sk-、um, skim over some of the arithmetic here and focus only on this function here. You know what malloc is, or at least generally familiar. Take a guess what realloc does. Just, yeah, and it's not quite adding memory, it reallocates memory as follows. 
if there's still room at the end of the string to give you more of that memory than it originally gives you, then you'll get that additional memory. So you can just keep putting the string's characters back to back to back to back. But if that's not the case, because you waited too long and something random got plopped in memory there, but there's extra memory down here, that's OK. Realloc is going to do all the heavy lifting for you, move the string you've read in thus far from here. Put it down there and then give you some more runway at that point. So, with a wave of the hand, let me say that what SketString is doing is it's starting with a small buffer, maybe one single character. And if the user types in two characters, GetString ends up calling realloc and says, ooh, one character wasn't enough. Give me two characters. Then, if you read through the logic of the loop, it's going to say, ooh, the user typed in three characters. Give me now not two, but four characters. Then give me eight. Then give me 16 and 32. The fact that I'm doubling the capacity each time means that the buffer Is not going to grow slowly. It's going to grow super fast. And what might be the advantage of that? Why am I doubling the size of the buffer even though the user might just need one extra character from the keyboard? What's that? Exactly. You don't have to grow it as often. And this is just kind of a, a, you're hedging your bets here. The idea being that you don't want to call realloc a lot because it tends to be slow. Anytime you ask the operating system for memory, as you'll soon see in a future problem set, it tends to take some time. So minimizing that amount of time, even if you're wasting some space, tends to be a good thing. But if we read through the final part of getString here, and again, understanding every single line here is not so important today, but notice that it eventually calls malloc again and it allocates. Exactly as many bytes as it needs for the string, and then throws away by calling free the excessively large buffer if it indeed got doubled too many times. So, in short, that's how getString has been working all this time. All it does is read one character at a time again and again and again, and every time it needs some additional memory, it asks the operating system for it by calling realloc. Any questions? All right, so an attack. Now that we understand pointers, or at least、uh, are increasingly familiar with pointers, let's consider how the whole world starts to collapse if you don't quite defend against adversarial users, people who are trying to hack into your system, people who are trying to steal your software by circumventing some, ser-、uh, some uh, registration code that you, they might otherwise have to type in. Take a look at this example here, which is just C code that has a function main at the bottom that calls a function foo. And what is it passing to foo? Single argument. So argv bracket one, which means the first word that the user typed at the command line after a dot out or whatever the program is called. So foo at the top takes in a char star, but char star is just what? So string. So there's nothing new here. And that string is arbitrarily being called bar. In this line here, char c12, in sort of semi technical English, what is this line doing? An array of. Characters. Give me an array of 12 characters. So we might call this a buffer. It's technically called C, but a buffer in programming just means a bunch of space that you can put some stuff in. Then lastly, memcopy, we've not used before, but you can probably guess what it does. It copies memory. What does it do? Well, it apparently copies bar, its input, into C, but only up to the length of bar. But there's a bug here. OK, so technically we should really do sterling of bar times size of char. That's correct. But in the worst case here, it's, let's assume that that's so. OK, then there's two bugs. So size of char. All right, let's make this a little wider. So now there's still a bug, which is what? Just check for what? OK, so we should generally be checking for null because just bad things happen when your pointer is null because you might end up going there and you shouldn't ever be going to null by dereferencing it with the star operator. So that's good. And what else are we doing? Logically, there's a flaw here, too. So check if our,、uh, argc is greater than or equal to 2. OK, so there's three bugs in this program here. <laughs> Right? We're not checking if the user actually typed in anything into argv bracket one. Good. So, what's the third bug? Yeah. Good. So, we checked one scenario. We implicitly checked don't copy more memory than would exceed the length of bar. So, if the string the user typed in is 10 characters long, this is saying only copy 10 characters. And that's OK. But what if the user typed in a word at the prompt like a 20 character word? This is saying, OK, copy 20 characters from bar into what? C, otherwise known as our buffer, which means you just wrote data to eight 
byte locations that you do not own. And you don't own them in the sense that you never allocated them. So this is what's generally known as a buffer overflow attack or a buffer overrun、uh, attack. And it's an attack in the sense that if the user or the program that's calling your function is doing this maliciously, what actually happens next could actually be quite bad. So let's take a look at this picture here. This picture represents your stack of memory. And recall that every time you call a function, you get this little frame on the stack, and then another, and then another, and another. And thus far, we've just kind of abstracted these away as rectangles, either on the board or on the screen here. But if we zoom in on one of those rectangles, when you call a function foo, it turns out that there's more on the stack. Inside of that frame and that rectangle, then just x and y and a and b, like we did talking about swap. It turns out that there's some lower level details, among them return address. So it turns out when main calls foo, main has to inform foo what main's address is. In the computer's memory. Because otherwise, as soon as foo is done executing, as in this case here, once you reach this closed curly brace at the end of foo, how the heck does foo know where? The control of the program is supposed to go. So it turns out that the answer that, to that question is in this red rectangle here. This represents a pointer, and it's up to the computer to store temporarily on the so called stack the address of main so that as soon as foo is done executing, the computer knows where and what line in main to go back to. Saved frame pointer relates similarly to this. Char star bar here represents what? Well, now this blue segment here is foo's frame. What is bar? OK, so bar is just the argument to the foo function. So now we're back at sort of the familiar picture. There's more stuff and more distractions on the screen, but this light blue segment just is what we've been drawing on the chalkboard for something like swap. That is the frame for foo. And the only thing in it right now is bar, which is this parameter. But what else should be in the stack according to this code here? Char C12. So we should also see 12 squares of memory allocated to a variable called C. And indeed, we do have that on the screen. The very top there is C bracket 0. And then the author of this diagram didn't bother drawing all of the squares, but there are indeed 12 there, because if you look at the bottom right, C bracket 11, if you count from 0, is the 12th such byte. But here's the problem in which direction is C growing? Sort of top down, right? If it starts at the top and grows to the bottom, doesn't look like we left ourselves much runway here at all. We've kind of painted ourselves into a corner, and that C bracket 11 is right up against bar, which is right up against stack frame pointer, which is right up against the return address. There's no more room. So, what's the implication then if you screw up and you try reading 20 bytes into a 12 byte buffer? Where are those eight additional bytes going to go? Inside everything else, some of which is super important. And the most important thing potentially is the red box there, return address, because suppose that you either accidentally or adversarially overwrite those four bytes, that pointer address, not just with garbage, but with a number that happens to represent an actual address in memory. What's the implication logically? Exactly. When foo returns and hits that curly brace, the program is going to proceed not to return to main. It's going to return to whatever address is in that red box. Now, in the case of sort of circumventing software registration, what if the address that's being returned to is the function that normally gets called after you've paid for the software and inputted your registration code? You can sort of trick the computer into not going here, but instead going up here. Or if you're really clever, an adversary. Can actually type in at the keyboard, for instance, not an actual word, not 20 characters, but suppose he or she actually types in some characters that represent code. And it's not going to be C code, it's actually going to be the characters that represent binary、uh, machine code, zeros and ones. But suppose they're clever enough to do that, to somehow paste into the get string prompt something that is essentially compiled code, and the last four bytes overwrite that return address, and what address? Does that input do? It actually stores in this red rectangle the address of the first byte of the buffer. So you have to be really clever. And this is a lot of trial and error for、uh, bad people out there. But if you can figure out how big this buffer is, such that the last few bytes in the input you provide to the program happen to be equivalent to the address of the start of your buffer, you can do this. If we say normally H E L L O and backslash zero, that's what ends up in the buffer. But if we're more clever and we fill that buffer with what we'll generically call attack code, A A A, attack, 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 where this is just something that does something bad, 
Well, what happens if you're really clever? You might do this. In the red box here is a sequence of numbers 80, C0, 3, 5,、uh, 0, 8. Notice that that matches the number that's up here. It's in reverse order, but more on that some other time. Notice that this return address has been deliberately altered to equal the address up here, not the address of main. So, if the bad guy is super smart, he or she is going to include in that attack code something like delete all of the user's files, or copy the passwords, or create a user account that I can then log into, anything at all. And this is both the danger and the power of C. Because you have access to memory via pointers, and you can therefore write anything you want into a computer's memory, you can make a computer do anything you want simply by having it jump around within its own memory space. And so, to this day, so many Programs and so many websites that are compromised boil down to people taking advantage of this. And this might seem like a super sophisticated attack, but it doesn't always start that way. The reality is that what bad people will typically do is whether it's a program at a command line or a GUI program or a website, is you just start providing nonsense. You type in a really big word into the search field and hit enter, and you wait to see if the website crashes or you wait to see if the program、uh, it manifests some error message. Because if you get lucky, as As the bad guy, and you provide some crazy input that crashes the program, that means the programmer didn't anticipate your bad behavior, which means you can probably, with enough effort, enough trial and error, figure out how to wage a more precise attack. So, as much a part of security as not just、uh, avoiding these attacks altogether, but detecting them and actually looking at logs and seeing what crazy inputs have people typed into your website, what search terms have people typed into your website in hopes of overflowing. Some buffer. And this all boils down to the simple basics of what's an array and what does it mean to allocate and use memory. And related to that, then, too, is this. So let's just glance inside of a hard drive yet again. So you recall from a week or two ago that when you drag files to your recycle bin or trash can, what happens? Yeah, absolutely nothing, right? Eventually, if you run low on disk space, Windows or Mac OS will start deleting files for you. But if you drag something in there, that is not at all safe, right? All your roommate or friend or family member has to do is double click and voila, there's all the sketchy files that you tried to delete. So most of us at least know that you have to like, right click or control click and empty the trash or something like that. But even then, that doesn't quite do the trick. Because what happens when you have a file on your hard drive? That represents some Word document or some JPEG, and this represents your hard drive. And let's say this sliver here represents that file, and it's composed of a whole bunch of zeros and ones. What happens when you not only drag that file to the trash can or recycle bin, but also empty it? Sort of nothing. It's not absolutely nothing now. Now it's just nothing because a little something happens in the form of this table. So there's some kind of database or table inside of a computer's memory that essentially has one column for files' names and one column for files' location, where this might be location one, two, three, just a random number. So we might have something like、uh, x.jpg and location one, two, three. And what happens then when you actually empty your trash? That goes away. But what doesn't go away is the zeros and ones. So, what's then the connection to PSET 4? Well, with PSET 4, just because we've accidentally erased the compact flash card that had all of these photos, or just because it by bad luck became corrupted, doesn't mean that the zeros and ones aren't still there. Maybe a few of them are lost because something got corrupted in the sense that some zeros became ones and ones became zeros. Just bad things can happen because of buggy software or defective hardware. But many of those bits, maybe even 100% of them, are still there. It's just that the computer or the camera. Camera doesn't know where JPEG 1 started and where JPEG 2 started. But if you, the programmer, know with a bit of savvy where those JPEGs are or what they look like, so you can analyze the zeros and ones and say, ooh, JPEG, ooh, JPEG, you can write a program with essentially just a for or while loop that recovers each and one of those files. So the lesson then is to start securely erasing your files if you'd like to avoid this altogether. Yes? Have more memory than you did before? Oh, good question. So, why then, after emptying the trash, does your computer tell you that you have more free space than you did before? In a nutshell, because it's lying.、Um, more technically, 
you do have more space because now you have said you can put other stuff where that file once was, but that doesn't mean the bits are going away. And that doesn't mean the bits are being changed to all zeros, for instance, for your protection. So, by contrast, if you securely erase files or physically destroy the device, that really is the only way sometimes around that. So, why don't we leave on that semi scary note? And we will see you on Monday.